Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar today. I'm just going to give it a few more minutes to let some more people join. So I'll start in a minute. Right, let's make a start. So firstly, I just want to say hi to everybody on the call today. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on risk integration, where we'll be discussing how you can incorporate your climate change risk assessments into your enterprise risk management framework. My name's Alice Tidswell. I'm a lead consultant in the ESG strategic advisory team at SLR. And I'm joined today by my colleague, John Mark Zuko, who's the head of operations in our team. We can move on to the next slide, please. So before we begin, I'm just going to run through a little bit of housekeeping. So that we can avoid background noise, we'll be muting all participants, but please do share any questions and comments with us in the chat function, which you should be able to see on your screen. And thank you to advance to those who have managed to send questions before the webinar. And if you do have any questions throughout that we aren't able to answer, please do get in touch with us afterwards. Next slide, please. So just to provide a little bit of background on SLR, we're a global strategy and management consulting practice spanning six regions and offering services in over 35 different technical areas covering environment, engineering, science and advisory. Now, for those of you who are joining us here for the first time, this is our third webinar that we are hosting as part of our four part TCFD webinar series. This series is designed to take you through the stages of TCFD alignment and integration into business planning and financial decision making, one step at a time. We've previously covered scenario narratives and financial modelling, and today's webinar will cover ways in which we can take the outputs from financial modelling and start to bring them into an organisation's wider enterprise risk management framework. A word of note on today's talk, the content will probably be most relevant to those who already have an enterprise risk management framework in place within their organization, or those who are thinking about doing so and have a relatively high level of maturity on risk management. However, even if your organization doesn't take an enterprise risk management approach, I hope that the content will still be of interest to you. In today's talk, I'm going to be covering some of the following areas. So firstly, what do we mean by risk integration? Why should we be integrating climate risk into our businesses? What the TCFD guidance says on the matter? How risk indicators can support risk integration? And what risk indicators look like in practice? And hopefully we'll have some time for questions towards the end of the presentation. So what do we mean by climate risk integration? Next slide, please. So before I go into the whys and the hows, I thought I'd just briefly cover what I mean when I say climate risk integration, so that we're all on the same page. Climate risk integration refers to taking the outputs from your standalone climate risk assessment and scenario analysis that you'll have carried out as part of your TCFD alignment and seeking to bring these under the organization's umbrella of group risk management and the existing risk management framework that you have in place, whether this be an enterprise risk management approach or a standalone risk management approach held within the risk management function. The purpose of climate risk integration is to ensure that the climate risks that you've identified and assessed are not treated and managed in isolation by specialist teams, but are instead adopted more widely within the business and considered alongside more traditional business risks. Next slide, please. So why should we integrate climate risk? Next slide. Okay. 
So in our last webinar on financial modelling, we spoke to you about financial modelling and calculating the financial impact of climate risks and opportunities. And two of the three key items that we asked you to consider following financial modelling, and we asked our clients to consider, are engaging the business in the results and preparing for auditor questions. And under each of these items, there are some key questions that should be considered, including what actions are required to manage the risk? And perhaps more importantly, how material is climate change? And as such, how is it being treated in proportion to your other business risks? On this second question, what auditors are prompting for here is how you're using the outcomes of your financial modelling to manage any material climate risks in a similar fashion to how you would manage and disclose your other principal business risks in your annual filings. In other words, have you integrated climate risks into your mainstream risk management processes? And how have you done this? The integrating climate risks into mainstream risk management is an important next step to ensure that the outcomes of your financial modeling can be embedded into the organization's processes in a way that supports your decision makers and the organization's capital allocation process. Next slide, please. Findings from the latest TCFD status report, which was released a couple of weeks ago, show that the risk management disclosure element, C, has the second lowest rate of alignment amongst respondents across all sectors, with strategy C, resilience of strategy, experiencing the lowest rate of disclosure alignment. It's not surprising given that 75% of companies surveyed by the TCFD indicated that risk management recommendations are somewhat or very difficult to implement. Risk management C refers to the integration of climate risk into a company's broader risk management practice for the topic of this conversation. Yet only 25% of responders were able to adequately describe how the processes they had in place for identifying, assessing, and managing climate-related risks are integrated into their company's overall risk management. This figure reduces to just 16% when we consider companies with less than $3.2 billion market capitalization. These figures indicate that climate risks and opportunities are still very much being considered in isolation from other organisational risks, such as credit risk or cyber security. And this is contrary to the aims of the TCFD. And whilst some organisations may not have identified any material climate risks or opportunities to their business, and this is quite possible depending on the sector that you are within, considering them in isolation with other risks increases the likelihood that as climate risks evolve with time, risk owners and the wider organisation will not be adequately equipped with the tools and processes that they require to monitor and appropriately manage these risks in a timely fashion. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to take you through some of the benefits of integrating climate risk into the right wider risk management practice. The first is enhanced resilience. By integrating climate risks into your wider risk management practices, organisations can help ensure that their whole business is aware of and understands what climate risks mean and what they mean in the context of the wider business. This thereby supports an organisation's ability to respond to the complex and often interconnected array of risks that they might have, and indeed how climate risk may influence other principal risks in their risk register. A common business language. And this applies to climate, ESG, and wider business risks. And by having a common language through the process of integrating climate risk into the wider risk management, it helps bring climate into mainstream thinking. This then supports things like improved resource and capital allocation. Quite often we find that resources aren't adequately allocated to climate risks and their opportunities. And more often than not, this is because they're not well understood in the wider business and strategic context. By bringing them under the wider risk management process that an organisation has in place, resources can there, but therefore be allocated more effectively and in a manner that is proportional to the materiality of the climate risk to the business. This brings me on to efficiencies and scale. By bringing climate risks within your wider risk management framework and managing them alongside your other entity level risks, we can minimise inefficiencies in managing climate risks separately particularly where climate risks are held in a separate part of the business and not aligned with other business risks. This then leads us on to improved disclosure. The TCFD recommendations asks that organisations integrate their climate risk into their broader risk management framework. 
By doing so, organizations can benefit not only from achieving compliance with things like the SCA ruling, but they can also improve the transparency of their risk management practices to investors and customers. So what the TZD guidance says. So let's just go on to what the TCFD guidance actually tells us. The TCFD has guidance for risk management integration and disclosures, and it draws on recommendations from the Committee of Sponsoring Organisations of the Treadway Commissions, COSO for short, Enterprise Risk Management Framework, or ERM Framework. Most organisations that have ERM frameworks in place will have probably aligned themselves with either the COSO ERM Framework or the ISO 31000 Framework. And it may be that companies have aligned themselves with other frameworks in place, there are sector specific ones or an independent approach may be taken. And although the TCFD guidance uses the COSO ERM framework as the foundation for discussing risk management integration and its recommendations, the recommendations that are provided are applicable to risk managers aligning themselves with either framework or any of their own interpretations of these frameworks, in addition to companies who use their own company specific processes. The COSO ERM framework has five key components, which are detailed at the bottom of the screen here. And these can apply to, and these can be applied to ESG related and climate risks. These components probably look and seem familiar to the principles of the TCFD framework, particularly the matters on governance and culture, strategy, performance, and risk management, and review and revision targets. So I'm just going to take you through these one by one and what they actually mean. So firstly, governance and culture. This is asking companies to consider who has risk ownership and who is responsible for managing the risks and setting the strategy. And how does this strategy align with the risks and the risk appetite? Does the organisation have a transparent and open culture when it comes to risk management? On strategy and objective setting, this refers to the corporate risk appetite and future business objectives and plans for growth. This will affect what risks and opportunities are firstly acceptable to the business, and what opportunities may likely materialise depending on the strategic growth of the organisation. Performance. This is how risks are being identified, assessed and prioritised. What does the view of risk look like at the portfolio level and what does it look like at a more granular level within the business? Review and revision. How are you going to monitor and manage these risks once you've identified them and assessed them? How are you going to implement management responses and monitor the performance of them? And the final one is information communicating and reporting. What are you disclosing externally in your annual filings and your ESG reports versus what is the internal communications like of risk within your business? How are internal communications distributed on risk and risk management? And how can the information that is held internally within a business enhance value across the organisation? And if we go on to the next slide, we can go into a little bit more detail on what this guidance actually tells us. So when we delve into the TCFD guidance and the cost of recommendations for ESG risks into ERM, one of the first things it asks risk owners and managers to acknowledge and consider is acknowledging that climate related risks have unique characteristics. Now, this is particularly important when we come to understand point two on the iterative approach that the TCFD recommends for integrating climate risks into risk management. Without acknowledging that climate-related risks have unique characteristics, understanding what needs to change within your risk management process and how things should be adjusted is going to be challenging. Some of the examples of the unique characteristics of climate risk could be the temporal scale over which they materialize. Quite often we know that climate risks will materialise over a much longer time frame, particularly for physical risks, but this can apply to transition risks too. Secondly, the effects that they have in different geographies. Climate risks may not affect a business that operates across several geographies in the same way. For example, your American business may suffer from different types of transition risks to your British business or your South African business. And the effects that they have could be very different to the overall business strategy and the financial performance. Thirdly is the uncertainty involved. And this is why scenario analysis is so important. There's so much uncertainty involved in climate related risks. And finally, the complex relationships and systematic effects that climate related risks can often have with each other and existing business risks. 
If the guidance provided by the TCFD then supplements this with four key areas to consider for effective integration as you go through this iterative approach on screen. The first is interconnections. All relevant functions across a business should be involved for effective integration. Without the input from the teams beyond the risk management team that are affected by the risks themselves, and this includes the governance and management at the organisation too, an understanding of the climate-related risk or the opportunity in the context of the wider business cannot be achieved. Without building consensus and understanding across the business, climate risk cannot be adequately monitored and managed. Temporal orientation beyond traditional planning horizons. More often than not, we find as part of our TCFD process and the work that we do with our clients, that an organization's existing time horizons in their risk management framework are inadequate for analyzing climate related risks. Most businesses tend to plan out to five years at maximum. And this is not long enough for climate related risks to be considered as they typically evolve and extend far beyond a five year period. So organizations should consider the appropriateness of their existing framework and be in a position to adapt it accordingly to facilitate the integration of climate risk into the wider framework. Thirdly, the item is proportionality. Integrating climate needs to be proportionate to the materiality of the climate risk of the business. This can be challenging to understand without having completed financial quantification and climate scenario analysis. Companies should be in a position to have a grasp on the materiality of their exposure to climate related risks and opportunities and the implications they have at a strategic and a financial level. And this understanding should be in relation to the existing operational, financial and strategic risks that a company has already identified in the wider business context. Finally, consistency. However you decide to integrate climate related risks, it should be consistent with your broad ERM or risk management processes that you currently have in place. We're not asking you to reinvent the wheel here, you should be using what you already have. Where possible, for example, existing key risk indicators should be leveraged. These are existing metrics that the organisation already has in place for managing and monitoring climate related risks, well, not climate related risks, other risks. In addition, allocation of risk owners and the application of different risk management responses, for example, accepting, transferring or mitigating risks should be conducted in a manner that's consistent with the treatment of other business risks. And it's on these final two points on proportionality and consistency that I'm going to discuss further in the rest of this webinar through the use of climate risk indicators. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So how could risk indicators support integration? We all know that climate risks aren't static, they change with time. So why should the management responses and the treatment of them all be static? In short, they shouldn't. When we're treating climate risks, we should be treating them in a manner that is consistent with the approach we take to managing other business risks. On screen here, I have an excerpt from the COSO framework for applying ERM processes to ESG and climate related risks. And I recommend that everyone on the call goes and takes a look at this guidance, because it's really helpful. I'd like to just highlight point three in green. This will probably look familiar to those of you who have sought to align yourself with the strategy and risk management pillars of the TCFD framework. Most companies seeking to align with the TCFD recommendations will have carried out these points in point three on the COFO ERM framework. And this includes identifying, assessing, and prioritizing risks as part of the alignment to the strategy pillar. Depending on the materiality of the risks that have been identified and assessed, it may be that organizations also think about implementing management or risk responses too. But how do we make sure that these are then adequately integrated into the wider business planning process and the wider ERM process? Instead of sitting static in a climate risk function or an ESG function across in the business or sitting static in our TCFD disclosures. Well, the next stage is this point four. Companies should be thinking about adopting an approach for reviewing and revising their climate related risks as part of their ERM processes. And as part of this, organizations need tools to review, tools or processes to review the effectiveness of their current risk management activities, whilst also alerting them to any changes in the risks that would affect the assessment of the risk and the subsequent treatment. And this includes the management activities that are being taken, whether this mitigation or adaptation. And climate risk indicators are one way of doing this. 
They are decision useful metrics that can be used to assess, monitor and evaluate exposure within time. And this can apply to both your risks and opportunities. They can also support the assessment of climate risk proportionality to other non-climate related risks by using similar measures of change to an organization's existing KPIs or if they have them in place, KRIs. This helps aid organizations as they seek to integrate climate risk into their wider risk management practice by having a common metric in place for understanding it. So what does it look like in practice? So to provide a little bit of context to the conversation we've just been having and what I've been discussing, I'm going to talk you through what risk indicators could look like in practice for your business. Before I go into the details, and I appreciate there's quite a bit going on on this slide, I'd like to point out that when thinking about setting risk indicators, organisations should consider what KPIs or key risk indicators they already have in place for their current business risks, particularly the principal risk. And this will ensure that when you start to integrate climate risks, you'll be taking a consistent approach to integrating these risks into your wider ER framework. For example, most organisations will probably now report on their carbon intensity, whether on a voluntary basis or mandated. Similarly, more mature organisations may already have KPIs in place relating to capital allocation and how capital is allocated to different business activities, for example, decarbonisation. If your organisation is less mature in your climate journey or doesn't have a sophisticated risk management framework already in place, either because of the size of your business or where you are on your climate journey, it may be more appropriate to use indicators from existing frameworks, such as the GRI indicators. Here on screen, I have an example of what would perhaps be relevant to an organisation with several energy intensive sites and high scope one or two emissions. For climate risk indicators to be truly effective, they should be able to monitor both the risk itself and the effectiveness of the actions you put in place to mitigate or manage the risk. In other words, we want to think about setting up both activity and outcome indicators to assess the risk itself and the effectiveness of the actions that we've put in place. The example I have here on slide is a common transition that the industrial sectors face. And that is the high costs and potentially limited technologies available to decarbonize the emissions intensity of their operations. A management action that an organization might consider to manage this risk could be the installation of solar PV panels at their industrial sites. Now, if you look at our climate risk indicators that we may use to use, let's start with the activity indicators. So we might want to separate this out into the input and processes. And when we look at the input indicators, we might be looking at the resources that have been used or spent on a business activity, so the capital allocated, for example. And in this case, I've got the example as the climate, as the uh, capital investment into solar PV. We then want an indicator to understand the effectiveness of the process that we're putting in place. So this is an indicator that measures the activities that are being undertaken with the resources that we've allocated. And the example here is the number of solar PV units installed. Then we want a way of monitoring the effectiveness of these actions. So we want an output indicator. And this is the results from the activities undertaken. In this case, the, the output indicator is the renewable electricity consumed. And then we want an indicator that helps us understand the impact of our actions on the social or environmental capital. And in this case, this is the scope two emissions. And these indicators combined can help us understand the amount of the amount of activity that's taking place to manage a risk, the evolution of the risk itself as we implement these management responses, and the effectiveness of them. In terms of who's responsible for monitoring these climate risk indicators, this will probably depend on the organisation and the existing risk management framework that you have in place. So if all your KRIs are currently managed by the risk owners as set out in your risk management framework, then it, this approach will probably be most suitable for your climate risk indicators too, to ensure consistency in the approach taken for your climate risks and your wider business risks. However, if your key risk indicators in your risk management process is held in a central location in a risk management team, for example, 
then perhaps it might be more appropriate for your climate risk indicators to be monitored within this central team also. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So in terms of disclosure and supporting the integration of climate risks, I have another example here on screen where climate risk indicators have been applied in the climate risk management process to support the integration of climate risks into the group risk register. Our client here in this case is using the outcomes of financial modelling that we've done with them to support them in identifying potential climate risk indicators to aid the decision making process. The aim here is to then use these climate risk indicators to support the integration of climate risks into their wider ERM framework with indicators in place and control measures and indicators to monitor them that are based on the materiality of their climate risks in relation to the other business risks. Next slide, please. And when we take this one step further, we can then use climate risk indicators to support our business planning approaches. Something that is becoming more apparent is the need for longer term planning outlooks. And this is owing to the uncertainty and temporal nature of climate related risks. And this is particularly important to high emitting sectors, but also any organisation that has identified material climate impacts to their business under a rapid transition scenario or even a high warming scenario, depending on the nature of the business itself. Climate risk indicators can be used to inform decision and trigger points in dynamic planning approaches such as dynamic adaptive pathways planning. This is coincidentally the topic of our next and final webinar in the TCFD webinar series, where we're going to explore how we can take the work done to align with the TCFD framework and apply it to longer term business planning to improve resilience. If we just move on to the next slide, please. So before I move on to questions, and I appreciate we're probably running short on time for questions, I'd just like to highlight to those on the call who are thinking about improving their climate risk management approach, that our team of experts here at SLR can be on hand to support you regardless of your TCFD maturity, your risk management maturity, and where you are on your climate journey. We can support with integration recommendations, helping you to review the suitability for ERM and your ERM alignment, and supporting you to set key risk indicators for your climate risks to support you on your integration journey. So any questions? I don't know if we've got any questions in the chat pane. Um, no, we haven't got any questions yet, Alice, um, but if anyone wants to put any questions in the chat, we can always circle back. Um, just to add on a few points Alice has made, I think Companies, um, when thinking about climate risk, have an opportunity to be able to consider climate risk as a standalone risk. Alternatively, they can understand or seek to understand how climate risks impact their existing risks within the, the risk register. And so that's one key decision point to make. I think there's advantages and disadvantages of both methodologies. Um, I think another area which Alice picked up on is calibration. So you might go through a climate scenario analysis and we at SLR will look at magnitude of impact, um, likelihood of occurrence, and adaptive capacity as assessment criteria. But when we speak to our clients, they might have slightly different criteria, such as velocity of impact. So it's important to be able to have an early conversation with risk management to understand how you calibrate those assessment criteria to make sure that your climate risks are comparable with other types of risks. Um, uh, so I, I, I was waiting for an opportunity to be able to add those points, Alice, but I didn't want to interrupt you. So I thought I'd add them to it. <laughs> That's fine. Hopefully Thanks that gives so some yeah, no points. Thanks, John. So I don't think we have a huge amount of time for questions. There's only a couple of minutes left. And I'm sure you're all eager to go and get your lunch. Um, so if we could just move on to the next slide. I'd just like to remind you that our next and final session in the TCFD webinar series will follow on from today's session and we'll explore adaptation planning using a dynamic adaptive pathways planning approach. So I really hope you can all join us for that. It's on Wednesday the 22nd of November at the same time as today's webinar. And if in the meantime you do have any questions for myself or the team here at SLR or you'd like to get in touch about our services on TCFD, please do not hesitate to get in touch and reach out.